going on, guys? Thank you so very much for joining me right here for the number one pro wrestling podcast in all of the IWC. This is Off the Script, episode 314, part number one for your Friday, February 21st, 2020. And man, oh man, man, oh man, what a week it has been. What a week it has been, man. Take a sip of my coffee. Gonna need it. I'm gonna need it. This has been one of the most up and down weeks I think I could possibly ever remember in the pro wrestling world. Sunday night, we've seen TakeOver. Absolutely amazing show from top to bottom. One of the best TakeOvers that I think WWE has ever produced. If it's not the best, which I don't think it is. Some people were saying it's the best. I honestly think that NXT TakeOver New York escaped their memory. It's definitely in the top three, though. But that TakeOver show was incredible. We were as high as a kite following that show. I remember I really couldn't sleep at the end when I had finally laid down to rest that night. It was just so filled with adrenaline. And that's what usually happens after those TakeOver shows, man. They're just... So crazy and so intricate and so detailed and so great. It just brings me back to a place that I love when I think about pro wrestling. Takeover was amazing. And then we go to Monday Night Raw. So we're high on Sunday and then depressed and sad and just feeling like complete garbage on Monday night. That's what Monday Night Raw typically does to you. Now, granted, they've been a little bit better. Monday Night Raw has been better, but man, Monday sucked. Monday was awful. I don't know who watched that show and thought that was a good show. Had people arguing with me that don't watch the show because I've actually praised the slight progress on Monday night. But man, oh man, was that show fucking awful on Monday night. That main event was a complete, it, it was just one of those things that I opted not to watch because I knew I wasn't going to miss anything. So I stopped watching Raw at like 10.30. I came here to record and I got done with my Monday night work early because I knew we were going to be given nothing. Same old six-man tag. The week before, we got an eight-man tag. The story revolving around Monday Night Raw is absolutely in its repetitive stages now. Ricochet, Ricochet says he's earned a WWE championship match against Brock Lesnar. <laughs> oh man, it gets funnier every time I hear it. Oh, oh, so bad, so bad. Charlotte Flair talking about the women in NXT being entitled. <laughs> Oh, man, I don't know whether I was watching a wrestling show or a comedy show, man. Oh, so bad. Raw was trash. Raw was complete garbage. And then we hit Monday. Then we go to Wednesday and we're back high again. So we go from Sunday high, Monday down, Wednesday high. It's like you're on a roller coaster of emotion watching these shows. Wednesday was highlighted by a fantastic, best they've ever done, AEW Dynamite show in Atlanta, in Hotlanta. That crowd brought it. Cody and Wardlow in the steel cage. We got Kenny Omega and Adam Hangman Page defending the tag team titles against the Lucha Brothers. We got that tag team battle royal to crown the Young Bucks as the number one contenders. That match is set now. The tag team match at Revolution Bucks versus Page and Omega should be a barn burner. We got John Moxley and Jeff Cobb making his in-ring AEW debut. And Moxley and Jericho continuing their feud. Darby Allen incredibly over with the company. Nyla Rose cutting what I thought was a great promo. Unreal. Wednesday was awesome. NXT, not so awesome. I mean, it was a good show, but it was nowhere near the highs that AEW was. But Wednesday is a great night for pro wrestling. And then, then we get to Friday. 
Then we get to Friday. I don't know whether I want to just hit stop on this record button right now or cry. Because I know what is awaiting me in some, well, four or five hours or so. I feel like this depression is just, it's hanging over me, man. I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. <laughs> oh, man. I'm at SmackDown tonight. We got Lacey Evans. <laughs> we got Lacey Evans interviewed by Renee Young. We got an eight-man tag. An eight-man tag. That means absolutely nothing. And we got the Bella Twins! <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. I really appreciate you, bro. Really appreciate it, man. Man, you're doing a huge just service to everybody. Thank you for allowing us to realize early on, before we have even have to sit on Friday night in front of our TVs, that... A, we're not going to watch SmackDown. We'll go find something else to watch. We don't know. Uh, uh, listen, Guy Fieri has a new season of Triple D. Or if I should go out to the bar and just get trashed. This is SmackDown, folks. You, you want to hit the bottom of the barrel depression. Then you're going to watch Friday Night SmackDown tonight. Awful. Absolutely awful. We go from TakeOver to SmackDown. How... Is this the same fucking company? How is this the same company? Who are these people? Are, are they like from another fucking planet? Are they from the planet in which pro wrestling doesn't exist? How the fuck do we go from here to down here? In five days! Unreal. So, I'm envisioning tonight, the review is about 20 minutes. Yes, because I can't wait to explain how everybody needs to be happy for the fucking Bella Twins going into the Hall of Fame. And Lacey Evans crying a fucking river of tears because she's got an abusive father. Who the fuck cares about this shit? Please, some more force-fed garbage down your gullet, Vince. Jesus Christ. Tell you what's not force-fed. The news on this show, man. I can't wait to... uh dive into all that I got here on the show. It's going to be a uh, doozy of an episode. I'm in some mood. I'm caffeinated. I'm ready to go, man. So thank you guys so much for joining me. It really is crazy how the week has just been so up and down. It's been great and then terrible. Great and then terrible. And then the discrepancies between the good and bad is just its unreal, man. I, it should not be that way. Should not be that way at all. But we're going to go over SmackDown, Raw, AEW, NXT, and all the news sprinkled in coming out of each brand. That's what we do here on Friday. And then the big story, Baron, I shall not call him King Corbin because he is no such thing. He is a fucking loser, Baron Corbin. The guy sucks. The guy sucks big, fat, sweaty balls, does Baron Corbin. Baron Corbin has called Dave Meltzer a cancer to the pro wrestling community. And man, I can't wait to tell you why he went on and called Dave Meltzer a cancer to the pro wrestling community. It was based off of a tweet that was in defense of Elias versus John Cena and the rumor of their WrestleMania match. Someone... A human being actually defended John Cena and Elias happening at WrestleMania. And Baron Corbin wanted to throw his two cents in. This is the big story, folks. Baron Corbin gets dumber and dumber every time he opens his mouth. Every time we see him on television. This is what started Baron Corbin off. Bro, if the term or the terminology rent-free applies anywhere 
it absolutely applies in this situation. Dave Meltzer is living rent-free in Baron Corbin's kingdom. What a fucking sad state Baron Corbin is in right now, man. Unreal. We're going to go over that right here on the podcast. Again, thank you guys so very much for joining me here on the podcast. 314, part one. This is off the script. Hit that subscribe button down below. Turn on that bell for all notifications. Follow me on social media, at JD from NY206. That's on Twitter and Instagram, so make sure you guys do that as well. If you guys want to check out all of the other contents that I have provided you graciously through my ministry, follow me, my sons. Follow me, my sons. Did you know that CM Punk has a fucking shirt in the same vein as Seth Rollins? Did you know that Sammy Guevara, he wore it on Dynamite, has a similar shirt? I have. A Messiah shirt. Everybody, this is the new trend now in the fucking community. Let's get everybody to come up with their own design and make their own Messiah t-shirt. But outside of the clown on Monday night, the Monday night clown, I think I'm in pretty good company, bro. I think I'm in pretty good company. But uh, make sure you guys check out all the other videos that you might have missed on the channel. Raw, NXT, AEW, and then... uh, my takeover review from Sunday and then off the script if you guys missed last weekend's off the script. That takeover review was awesome. Go and check that out. Everything you need is linked down below in the description of this very video. And if you guys want to go get that t-shirt, man, the YWC Messiah, the new off the script design is available on bonfire.com. You guys can get yours today. I will leave you guys a link down below in the description right at the very top. Go and get yours today. Bonfire.com. They did an awesome job on getting that campaign up. My boy Mikey did a great job on the design. I love it. And hopefully you guys go out there and support by getting a t-shirt and becoming a part of the ministry of Off The Script. Thank you guys for all that. Let's get into the news. Talk about SmackDown. SmackDown's rating was in early Saturday morning. And SmackDown featured an interview from WWE Hall of Famer Hulk Hogan from his beach shop, a women's title match that was actually very good. Carmella and Bailey brought it, and I praised how good it was, so please do not tell me that I'm over- overly negative. I thought the match kicked ass, and that was Carmella's best match ever. And then, obviously, Otis and Mandy Rose in their Valentine's date, and Otis being heartbroken. Sad state of affairs with Otis and Dolph Ziggler. Despite a pretty decent show, Pretty decent show. And I said as much. It wasn't as bad. Show Buzz Daily is reported that SmackDown brought in an average of 2.482 million viewers. The first hour brought in 2.521 million, while the second hour dropped to 2.442 million. Importantly, the show drew a 0.7 rating in the all-important 18 to 49 demographic for Valentine's Day. By comparison, last week, SmackDown brought in 2.538 million viewers as as an average across all two hours. This means that the show averages 56,000 viewers less than last week. For what it's worth, SmackDown was still the most watched wrestling show of the week. Obviously, it was. It's on Fox. I mean, what kind of statement is that? Oh, we're still the most watched show during the week because it's on the biggest network. Yes, please go and boast about that meaningless statistic. Raw and AEW average viewership figures of 2.337 million and 757,000 respectively last week. While AEW Dynamite brought in, or NXT rather, Raw and NXT. AEW Dynamite brought in 817,000 viewers. So that was that. SmackDown, it's on the biggest network. It wasn't that bad last week. It did the job. It was something for two hours that kept me entertained thoroughly throughout. Can we say the same thing about this week? Clearly not. They gave you a decent show on Friday last week. Tonight, it's going to be a different story. Because this show looks like it is going to be an absolute disaster. feel like the review is going to be less than 30 minutes. And I would not mind if that is the case. I really wouldn't. SmackDown continues to be terrible. It is the worst show in the industry right now. Bruce Pritchard has got to be fired. I don't know. You know, the rumors of Vince McMahon not being there, I I don't... Listen, I want to believe that he's not there because he's got so much on his plate 
But what's the difference if he's there or not? He hired somebody in his place that's a mirror image of the way he thinks. Bruce Pritchard's known Vince McMahon for 30 fucking years. Of course he's going to book the same show in the eyes and in the mind of how Vince McMahon would do it. That's why he's there. That's why he's there. For everybody thinking, oh, Bruce Pritchard's going to bring SmackDown to prominence, and I got to hear people telling me that you got Eric Bischoff praising the creative genius of Bruce Pritchard and fucking Conrad Thompson praising the creative genius of Bruce Pritchard. Where? Where? I love for you to show me where. I don't see it. All I see is Reigns, 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 Corbin, 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 garbage, 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 Ziggler, 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 garbage, garbage, garbage. That's all I see. And now we're getting the Bella Twins on Friday night, Lacey Evans on Friday night. Do you want to kill me, Bruce? Do you want to kill me? This is your public service announcement, folks. This is your public service announcement. The Bella Twins have been confirmed for Friday Night SmackDown. There you go. So if you guys are planning to maybe skip a segment on Friday night, here you go. It's been reported that along with the NWO and Batista, the Bella Twins will be getting into the Hall of Fame as part of the 2020 WWE class. Now, you know what I don't know? This is a this is something that I'm thinking about during the week while you guys are pushing fucking keyboards and typing up uh, data plans or whatever the fuck you guys do at work. I don't know. I'm thinking about this. I don't know why the Bella Twins weren't inducted in 2021. When WWE has, I don't know, WrestleMania going to Hollywood. You know, the Bella Twins are more Hollywood than anything. They're more Hollywood than they are WWE. They want to be reality TV. They want to have their own Birdie B clothing line. They want to have their own vineyard and their own wine and all this other shit. Why aren't they being inducted in Hollywood right in their own backyard is what I don't understand. But anyway, a moment of piss is happening on Friday night to undoubtedly reveal that they're going into the Hall of Fame. And I will look at the TV and said, ha ha. I knew this already. Thank you for wasting my time. Bruce! Bruce, thank you for wasting my time, bro. However, Nikki and Bree are not the only names who have been reported for this class. We will go over this tomorrow. The British Bulldog, Davey Boy Smith, finally. And JBL, John Bradshaw Layfield, who's got the entire fucking community blocked on Twitter. Because we all ragged on him when he was on commentary, which he was fucking god-awful. He was so bad. And Jushin Thunder Liger will also be honored at the WWE Hall of Fame. Pretty decent class, man. NWO, Batista, the Bella Twins, JBL, the Bulldog, Jushin Thunder Liger. There you go, man. WWE's got to keep those tickets coming in for the Hall of Fame. Nikki and Brie have not officially been announced for the Hall of Fame, but obviously with Alexa Bliss being there moderating it, we will certainly get the announcement. WWE has confirmed that the Bella Twins will be making their returns to WWE TV this week as they have been invited to a moment of piss, meaning piss break, on Friday Night SmackDown. So there you go. And we got a eight-man tag. Oh, joy, I can't wait. The Usos and the New Day team up. Wow, Bruce, your creativity is astounding, bro. My God. My God. First they were enemies and now they're friends. First they were feuding over the tag team titles and now they're teaming up. Wow. Oh. Oh, my God. This creativity is just mind-blowing. The Usos and the New Day team up in what is a revolutionary new concept against, against, get this, Robert Roode, Dolph Ziggler, Miz, and Morrison. I can't handle all this creativity, man. Oh, my God. I think I might be having heart palpitations. You fucking serious. Are you fucking serious? The Usos and the New Day. Oh, man, I can't wait. I can't wait against Dolph Ziggler, 
Bobby Roode, John Morrison, who is fucking unimportant, as unimportant could be at this juncture of the game, and the F-lister, The Miz. Hey, Bruce, how about pushing other tag teams on the show? Oh, that's right. You don't have any other tag teams. You don't have any other tag teams. You got two teams here as the heels who aren't even real teams. They're singles guys acting as tag teams. Nobody sees this, and yet they want to complain that I complain. Well, J.D., what are you complaining about? What are you complaining about, man? Why don't you just enjoy it for what it is? Nobody sees the issue here? You got the fucking revival that are constantly buried. And then you got the Usos in the New Day. Three tag, th- three legit tag teams on this show, two of which WWE will bend over backwards for any time they need to. And then you got two teams here as the heels that aren't really legit tag teams. Nobody sees the issue here in the tag team division. They just want to glance by it. Nobody wants to make an issue out of it. Nobody wants to bring awareness to it. But what is on the line? Seriously, what is on the line? Is Robert Roode's fucking uh, wellness violation on the line from the last two weeks? Are we going to find out what happened when he got suspended? Maybe Dolph Ziggler, maybe a lock of Dolph Ziggler's glorious blonde hair is on the line. Maybe the fucking bill that he sat down for Mandy Rose in the dinner that they had together. Maybe the bill is on the line in this match. John Morrison, maybe he's going to fucking parkour off a fucking turnbuckle in the match. What is going to be on the line for The Miz? Maybe one of uh, his daughter's dirty diapers is going to be on the line. Seriously. What's on the line here for the new day? Pancakes? A pancake recipe? Syrup? Maybe it's a waffle. Who the fuck knows? Maybe they'll swerve you. What a goddamn fucking waffle. What about the Usos? What about their blood alcohol content? Maybe the paperwork for that fucking DUI is going to be on the line. You fucking serious? If you're not going to make it interesting, what the fuck is the point in this match even happening? Unreal. Tag team title implications on the line? Give me a break. Give me a fucking break. This match is the antithesis of, you know what, I'm going to be lazy today. I don't give a shit today. The fans will eat it up no matter what we put out there today. Great job there, Bruce. Great job there, Bruce. I could fucking book this show. I could be in a fucking coma for six months and book this show better than Bruce Pritchard. Try me. Try me. Bailey versus Naomi is set for WrestleMania 36. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, really? Where do you guys envision Sasha Banks being at WrestleMania? Is she even going to be in Tampa at WrestleMania? Probably not. Probably not. I don't know. Bailey versus... Listen, I have... Before the fucking Cretans come at me, I have no issue with Naomi. I don't... I actually... I actually think Naomi is very talented. And I was very happy to see Naomi back. She is a good hand in the women's division. But if you're asking me, if you're asking me if this is a WrestleMania match, a worthy WrestleMania match, the answer is no. The answer is no. That does not interest me whatsoever. In fact, that is a fucking legit 10-minute bathroom break. I'm going to eat all the fucking potato skins and mozzarella sticks I possibly can and then go to the bathroom and shit it all out just so that I have an empty stomach for the next bathroom break. That's going to be undoubtedly smothered somewhere on the WrestleMania card. Bailey versus Naomi is set for WrestleMania 36. Last week, Bailey successfully defended her SmackDown Women's title against Carmella in what I thought was a very good match. Carmella's best match, period. And she will have another shot to get into contention. As she will face Naomi on Friday night, tonight. The winner of the match will face Bailey for the title at Super Showdown. So there you go. So if the title match is set for WrestleMania 36, either we get Carmella beating Naomi again to get another title shot, 
And then we get Naomi being built because there really is nobody else in the division to challenge Bailey for the title. What if Naomi beats Carmella, goes to Super Showdown, and gets a fuck finish handed to her, and then we gotta hear and see this feud just materialize over six weeks or so. I'm not really interested in that. Does WWE even have a storyline here to build Bailey and Naomi for WrestleMania 36? How about this one? How about we get Sasha Banks thrown in there and Sasha Banks back on SmackDown and we get Sasha Banks versus Bayley at WrestleMania 36. And before the Cretans start telling me that, oh, I don't want to see the match. We've seen it already. It's three years in the making. We don't really need to see it anymore because they wasted so much time. Yes, but if you look on this brand and you look at who's in the women's division, I don't see a WrestleMania worthy match. I'm not booking trash. At WrestleMania. I would prefer WWE not to book trash at WrestleMania. WrestleMania is for the elite. You're not going to put just anybody on this fucking show. There's nobody on this brand in that division worthy of a WrestleMania match outside of Bayley and Sasha Banks. And that is factual information. So I don't know how WWE is going to go about this. So, like I said, those are the only ways that we could go about it. Either Carmella beats Naomi, and then we get Bailey going over Carmella in Super Showdown, and then we get Naomi and Bailey being built for the remainder of the weeks leading into WrestleMania, or we get Bailey and Naomi because Naomi beat Carmella. We get that in Super Showdown, and there's a fuck finish. So then, where's Carmella gonna play into this? Because she's undoubtedly gonna want another fucking title shot. You might as well just go with option A here. Get Carmella out of the fucking way and just concentrate on Naomi and Bailey. You know what I can't wait for? The fucking tag team matches, repetitive every week, that we're going to get in the build for this. We're probably going to get Carmella and Naomi versus Bailey and fucking Dana Brooke. Or whoever the fuck is going to be joining this garbage feud on SmackDown Live. Can't wait. Can't wait. Where's Sasha? Sasha needs to come back. Fuck the Mandalorian. Come back to TV, please. We need you more now than ever. This is awful. Absolutely awful. I'm not interested in any of this, and that certainly isn't a WrestleMania match in my eyes. The New Day. The SmackDown Tag Team Champions. The New Day. They reveal an awesome angle that Vince did not approve for WrestleMania last year. Now, WrestleMania's build with Kofi Kingston was very good. Probably the best thing coming out of WrestleMania. And I am not really hiding that in any way. I've said this multiple multiple times over the year and during last year's WrestleMania season. Last year, WrestleMania 35, Kofi Kingston managed to defeat Daniel Bryan in what many look back on as the match of the night, and it really was, to capture the WWE Championship. Kofi's title win was a real good, feel-good WrestleMania moment. Now, while the feud between Bryan and Kofi was pretty good, some have condemned WWE for the inclusion of Vince McMahon. I don't really... Listen... I don't mind Vince McMahon being in the feud because it just added another element of, yeah, they're not going to do it for Kofi. They wanted to build up that fan, you know, anger. They wanted to build up that real good old-fashioned pro wrestling angle where everybody in the WWE knew the fans wanted it and they wanted to do everything in their power to kind of make you believe that it wasn't going to happen. And I love that type of stuff. I really do. Having Vince McMahon in the angle really didn't do anything for me. I, 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 in fact, I only think it enhanced it. Now, when Vince McMahon or the authority was interjected into the Daniel Bryant situation, that felt a little bit more real, you know? The only thing I could take away from the Vince McMahon inclusion here in the Kofi Kingston storyline last year is that they tried too hard to almost mirror what they did with Daniel Bryan and the authority. So that's my only takeaway. My only negative takeaway from that is the inclusion of Vince McMahon tried too hard to play off the similarities of what Brian, Triple H, and Stephanie McMahon did with Daniel Bryan. They argued that it was never clear why Vince McMahon didn't want Kofi to challenge for the title at WrestleMania. In fact, you know, you know, it might have been, and I know WWE would have never gone about doing this. It would have been great if they were just honest, you know, and they just went with the storyline of Kofi Kingston being a B-plus player. He was never believable. He was never good enough to be WWE champion. Imagine a perfect world 
where this could be played out on storyline if they could play up the fact of his skin color, you know? I, I think that would be... It would never get on TV, but it would have just been volcanic, you know? I don't know. I don't know. It, it's, again, mirrored what I said about Daniel Bryan. It was something along the line of, oh, oh he's not good enough, and he's a B-plus player, and that's the only reason why Vince McCann was included in there, because Triple H had nothing to do with the show. Stephen McMahon had nothing to do with this show. They were a little bit more honest. You know, they didn't have to really make it blatantly, or people like you, guys like you, aren't cut out for the WWE Championship. They really went about that and really garnered some real fucking heel heel. Like Jim Cornette, he wants AEW to play up the fact that Nyla Rose is, you know, this whole thing about her gender, play up the fact of her gender and really make her a dominating monstrous heel and a hated heel based off of what everybody's talking about with Nyla Rose and that's her gender. WWE did this in a very subtle way, but kind of blatant at the same time. You know, without really just throwing it out there to everybody, I think it would have been fucking huge. But I know for a fact that was never going to make it to TV. That's just me fantasy booking in a real babyface heel environment. Speaking of Kofi Kingston and Mr. McMahon, it has been revealed that the WWE canceled plans for an awesome angle that would have seen the New Day storm into Vince's office. This was actually revealed on the New Day's podcast. Big E revealed the plans for this angle. The original plan was that you and I, speaking to Kofi, we're supposed to go backstage, ripping things up, tearing things up as we go into his office. We go into Vince's office and we knock on his door and either he doesn't answer or he opens the door and says, I don't have time for you or something like that. The plan legitimately, and I was so excited for this, was that we kick in the door, we tear up his office, legit throw things over. I think he's in the office in the corner. We're throwing tables and making a mess of his office, just going on a rampage and like had this visceral anger about what's happening to Kofi. And one of those things that drove the storyline was that Kofi's story so closely paralleled Brian's, but to me, didn't feel like it was a ripoff or a derivative of Brian's story at all. And of course, the fact that you were pitted against Brian at WrestleMania when that time came. I think some of the language was interesting that he who shall not be named talked about you that you were a B-plus player, that you weren't good enough. It was a lot of thinly veiled when you got 13 years of experience. Like, why exactly aren't you good enough? See, that's where Big E, I do believe that's where Big E is going with that. You got 13 years of fucking experience with this. Why are you thinking that Kofi is not exactly good enough for the WWE Championship in a main event of WrestleMania? If they push that envelope as far as they could, I really do think that it really could have taken the storyline into a whole new world and just really made. And Brian being there, standing next to Vince McMahon, it, it would have made Brian's heel heat even more volcanic, and it would have been great, you know. But then I would have feel like if that was the case, then maybe some negative backlash would have come down on Daniel Bryan after that. People take this shit too seriously. But it played out nicely. Kofi's reign happened. He had the title for a good six, seven months. WWE tried their best to make him a legit champion. The way that they handled his reign at the end of it really was just a shame. And they just kind of wasted everything in the seven seconds that they pitted him against Brock Lesnar. But that would have been fun. That would have been fun. I don't know why Vince McMahon didn't like that angle. That would have been great. It would have been something different. You would have seen another... Dimension of the New Day, you would have seen more anger. I think we needed to see more anger. That's what I'm trying to get at. I think we need to see more anger in this storyline, really. And I don't think Big E was able to break out in the way that he wanted to just be there for his friend and defend his friend, you know. But it ended up working, and they discussed it. I thought that was interesting enough to put here on the podcast in the SmackDown portion of OTS. Baron Corbin. Baron Corbin, I shall not call him King Corbin, calls Dave Meltzer a cancer in the pro wrestling community. Now, all of this started by a simple tweet. And if I, I do have a screenshot of the tweet, I don't have it linked up to my OBS, 
But I will put it in post-edit. You guys will see that on the screen right now. Baron Corbin calls Dave Meltzer a cancer in the pro wrestling community because of this tweet. Because of this tweet. I don't believe that this got Baron Corbin all salty. Absolutely pathetic. Absolutely pathetic. Remember when people loved Elias. People are only shitting on him versus Cena at Mania because Dave Meltzer did it. These fans really don't have a mind of their own, says Danny Tejada on Twitter. About the people is his handle. You don't know a goddamn fucking thing about the people, bro. Yes, this is Dave Meltzer's fault. Dave Meltzer practices black magic. He has fucking sorcery spells that he just casts all over the fucking community. And he's brainwashing everybody at one fucking stroke, right? Right? Come midnight, he's poisoning everybody in the community. He's a fucking magician. Color me pink. I didn't know that about fucking Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez. Give me a break. Dave Meltzer is one of wrestling's most prominent and respected journalists. You might not like him. I know he's not the most uh, sought-after guy when someone gives an opinion on something, but he is absolutely the go-to for the majority of the community. If Meltzer and Alvarez talk about it, it's in the news. If Meltzer and Alvarez talk about it, it's always going to be a talking point for everybody. Wrestlers sometimes take issue with the work of Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer, often because he has criticized a segment promotion that they were a part of. So what? So what? Do you want me to go cut the fucking uh, flyers that I got in my mailbox? I think there's a coupon for fucking Kleenex. Please. Two for four at Acme. Give me a fucking break. People don't like him because he's criticized a segment or promotion that they're a part of. So what? You're on TV. You're on live television. You are an actor. We have every right to criticize anything that you do if you are a public figure. Give me a break. That tells me that pro wrestlers are the biggest fucking pussies that you'll find in all of entertainment. Seriously. Now, you either either do one thing or, or the other. You either approach them with respect and tell them graciously, you'll still get blocked. That I didn't agree with this segment, I didn't like this segment, and then state reasons why, they'll block you, and then they'll tell you, well, you're not a part of the... The industry, you don't know anything. If you can't wrestle, if you never got in the ring and wrestled, then you don't have a right to state your opinion. Or you could be negative and be a dick and then get blocked anyway. So it's a lose-lose situation. You're respectful and you tell them your opinion in a very wholesome manner, you get blocked. You tell them off in a typical Twitter troll-like way, you get blocked. Or if you're one of the people, one of the many people in WWE that you've never interacted with, right? I could interact with somebody and not get blocked. I could sit here and never interact with anybody and they will intentionally seek out my profile and block me. What the fuck does that tell you? What does that tell you? Champ? Corbin? I've never. I maybe tweeted at Corbin once and it was something about his fucking watch. He was wearing an IWC Top Gun. And I commented on his watch because I used to sell watches. I used to sell that particular brand of watches. Maybe he was wearing a Panerai. Maybe he was wearing a Rolex. I know he was wearing a Submariner on one of those Monday Night Raws that we seen him on when he was on Raw. Panerai, IWC, Rolex, whatever the fuck the guy was wearing. The guy's got good taste in watches. And I complimented him on that. But then when he moved to SmackDown and we started shitting all over the fucking segments with the dog food and Roman Reigns and the fucking feud that will never end, he took offense to this. And then he seeked out me and a lot of podcasters in the community and blocked them. So what does that tell you? That he intentionally seeked us out and blocked us. Awful. Awful. So... 
Meltzer has criticized segments and promotions and this and that, and everybody seems to be up in arms because God forbid someone expresses their opinion in the community. For example, former Universal Champion Seth Rollins took to social media towards the end of last year and called Meltzer a purveyor of misinformation before going to label him as a vindictive liar. Now, SmackDown star and former U.S. champion Baron Corbin has taken to social media to give his thoughts on Dave Meltzer. Baron Corbin liked an Instagram post because he's following these fucking absolutely irrelevant Instagram posts or Instagram fucking people. These accounts on Instagram that, you know, it's like, smark something or burying marks or smarks or whatever the fuck. Baron Corbin's the biggest fucking mark that there is. So of course he's going to follow a fucking an account like that on Instagram. These accounts, by the way, are the same accounts that give SmackDown on a miserable week. Oh, SmackDown was a 9.5 out of 10. The fuck are you watching? Who the fuck would listen to anything coming out of those accounts? These accounts post nothing of their personal life. These accounts live to post about positivity in WWE. These accounts, they live to block out every ounce of criticism that one would have on how bad the WWE actually is. They try and block it out. These are the accounts that take tweets like mine or tweets like Salamonster or tweets like fucking it could be Don Tony and Kevin Castle where they're critical about something they'll take they'll take tweets screenshot tweets from other podcasters and content creators in the community and they will plaster them on their Instagram wall and then pick it apart as if we are completely mindless buffoons and we are certainly not I mean we're like the smartest guys in the fucking community Give me, a, give me a break, you know? Give me a break. I know what I'm talking about, man. I know what I'm talking about. Come to where I am, say half the shit that you would say online to my face, and drink a beer with me. Drink a beer with me. I will school any one of you. Any one of you. You think what you see on Instagram and Twitter and fucking YouTube is all real life? These people think... Everything on social media is real life. Bro, go out and get a life. You have a fucking Instagram account with Baron Corbin or Becky Lynch or someone, Alexa Bliss, as your avatar. My God. My God. Can you be any more of a fucking degenerate? You are a social outcast. No friends. Guys are never fucking around any females at all. They've never felt a nice firm ass in the palm of their hand. They've never felt a pair of fucking perky tits in their entire life. Seriously. Have you even fucking cooked a dinner for a woman? Have you ever bought a woman a cold beverage? Have you even asked a woman out on a date? Have you even looked at a woman? Do you even know what a woman looks like? No. They fantasize and drool over Becky Lynch and Alexa Bliss and fucking this one and that one. And they pray and pray and pray to the fucking gods of Alexa Bliss that maybe one day she'll dump her fucking musician boyfriend, her pretty boy boyfriend, and maybe she'll get with a regular Joe like one of these guys and give these types of guys hope. That they could maybe get a hot girl like Alexa Bliss. <laughs> Give me a break. Baron Corbin liked an Instagram post from a fan saying that people are only down on the idea of John Cena taking on Elias at WrestleMania because Meltzer wasn't keen on the match. Yes, because Dave Meltzer's opinion is the vast majority of the entire community, right? Nobody else in the community has a fucking brain to think for themselves. This is what Baron Corbin said on this while he went on and called Dave Meltzer a cancer, not only to WWE, but the entirety of the wrestling business. Bro, Meltzer's living rent-free in your kingdom. How does it feel? How does it feel? I'm living rent-free in everybody's fucking head on Twitter. 
Forget about it. I'm in the mouth of everybody every fucking week. Every time these shows are on, people have my name in their mouth, bro. I am living rent free. My feet are up on the fucking recliner. I got fucking beer in the fridge that's fucking coming out. I can't even keep it cold. Motherfucker. And then I'm fucking your wife at the end of the night when this show is garbage. Popping a blue chew and I'm going to town. That's how rent free I'm living in these people's heads. Corbin says this. People need to realize that he's cancer to the entire wrestling industry, not just WWE. He inspired hatred to anything and everything he doesn't like or agree agree with. For example, I might not like a band, and that's fine, but what separates us is that I don't have to continuously bash them online or work to get others to hate them as well. I don't have the time or energy to be that negative of a person. Okay. Let me try and grasp what he's trying to say here. For example, this was a terrible example, by the way. For example, I might not like a band, and that is fine. But what separates us is that I don't have to continuously bash them online or work to get others to hate them as well. Now, he's comparing not liking a band to not liking a pro wrestling program. Let me see. Let me try and uh, let me try and devise a, a statement here and make sense of it. Baron Corbin is comparing a band who releases one album every two or three years or so, and if it's a band that I listen to maybe once every five or six years. Some bands, upon first listen, if they have a great album, you listen to it through. And you realize it's a great album. Sometimes a band puts out, sometimes that same band puts out a bad album. And I listen to it maybe three songs in. And I'm like, this shit sucks. This shit sucks. I'll put it down for a little bit. And then I'll go back and listen to it again. Give it another try. Maybe I'll listen to the first three tracks. And then the rest of the album in one sitting. Maybe I'll just digest it. You know, 25% here, 25% there, 50% here. And kind of get all of it and try and sit in on those multiple sittings and try and digest everything and then go back and listen to it all and then come up with a situation where I just don't like it. He's comparing being in a band to being on a live pro wrestling program. He's comparing being in a band where you put out one album every two or three years to a live wrestling program where he's on live TV once every week for 52 weeks a year. You see, the thing is, if a band knows they put out a shit album, they will do everything in their fucking power to go back and write a good album. Monday Night Raw and SmackDown on Fox, they'll put on a good show, and they will continuously put on a good show. They will listen to fan criticism. Where the band is going to listen to the fans' reaction if you put out a fucking world acclaimed record, and then the second record is complete dog shit, and the fans tell you They're going to go in the studio for their next album, make sure that doesn't happen again. And nobody's listening to the same fucking album once every week for 52 weeks. There's no reason to shit on a band 52 weeks a year. One time shitting is enough. Once. Once. You leave your little Amazon review, you leave a one star and move on with your fucking day. But you... You, you're a part of a show. You work for Bruce. You're a part of the worst show in the industry. That's live every week. And you refuse to get better. Yeah, you don't want us to shit on the show because the show should be surrounded in positivity. Everybody should speak highly and positive about SmackDown on Fox. Really now? Really now? I'm sorry. I don't know what the fuck you're watching. Do you go back and watch these fucking shows? What the fuck are you doing when you're done with your segment? Do you watch what the fuck is going on? I mean, who in their right mind would watch this shit and say, oh man, this is a great wrestling show. The show sucks. It's complete dog shit. Every single week. That was a god-awful example. 
separates us is I don't have to continually bash them online. Okay. Okay, so the band puts out a bad album. That's one bad album. You leave one bad review. You're done. You just don't like the album. Every time someone's going to fuck two, six months to a year after the album's released, you're not going to go online and say, oh, this band fucking sucks. This album sucks. Blah, 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 blah. You're still going to go see that band live in concert, right? I know I would. Because then you're not really a fan. And of course you would want to see the good album being performed. You don't even do that. How the fuck are you going to get people to come see SmackDown when none of your albums are good? None of your albums are good. Why would I pay to go see you live? Barry Corbin is a complete fucking idiot. A complete fucking idiot. Now, the tweet. The tweet. John Cena and Elias. John Cena and Elias. Remember when people loved Elias. People are only shitting on him versus Cena at Mania because Dave Meltzer called or did it or Dave Meltzer shit on it. These fans really don't have a mind of their own. Meanwhile, you go to this Danny Tejada's page. He's legitimately calling Baron Corbin his king. This is like some super fan, creepy, bizarre, morbid fucking shit that you go see this guy on his page. It is downright fucking morbid. Completely bizarre. Calling Baron Corbin a legitimate king, you know, praising this guy as if he's a fucking real ruler of a fucking empire. Here is a lesson here, folks. Here's a lesson, Danny Tejada, you fucking imbecile. How about this? Which this one might go right over your fucking head because people like this are the absolute, this guy here, Danny Tejada is the cancer of the wrestling community. Because they don't know any better. They're the ones who are brainwashed by WWE. Here's one. Here's one. How about this one? How about the match between John Cena and Elias just plain fucking sucks? How about that? Have you watched the last two WrestleManias? Wasn't Elias and John Cena in the last two WrestleManias together? Now you want to see it again. For what? This is a tweet that I can't stand. He'll go on and bash everybody bashing on it. He'll try and take the one thing people are talking about. This is the type of fan that will take one thing people are talking about and try and spin it and give a different opinion on it knowing that it fucking sucks so that he gets people like Baron Corbin to comment on it so that he'll get people in the community to comment on it because he has no friends. He's chasing clout. He's chasing Twitter recognition. The match fucking sucks. The one thing I can't stand... Is mediocrity. Enough with supporting mediocrity. I don't know what you guys think when you think of WrestleMania. I don't know what Baron Corbin or Danny Tejada thinks of fucking WrestleMania. But all I know is WWE wants to continue to boast about WrestleMania being its version of the Super Bowl. Or equivalent to the Super Bowl or bigger than the Super Bowl. Every sports, every sports league has a finals game. MLB has the World Series. NBA has the NBA Finals. The Super Bowl has the Super Bowl. You got the NHL Finals. You got the U.S. Open or the PGA Tour, whatever. You got Wimbledon. You got the French Open. You got the U.S. Open. You got these events that have these competitors competing in them that stand out from all the rest on a regular fucking Chase Manhattan Cup or where the fuck is going on, you know? You got the US Open, the PGA Open, the fucking all this other shit, and then you got the uh, the Amazon Invitational. 
somewhere in, in the middle of a fucking nothing month, right? Those are where the bums play. Those are where the fucking losers play. If you want the fucking guys that you want to admire and just cherish and you want memories and you want competition, you're going to go watch the PGA Tour. I don't know what this guy thinks of when he thinks of WrestleMania. I don't know what Baron Corbin thinks of when he thinks of WrestleMania. But when I think of WrestleMania, I'm certainly not thinking of John Cena versus fucking Elias. I'm not. You want the fucking Super Bowl, right? Every year, every every February, it's the best team in the AFC versus the best team in the NFC. There's no time for fucking losers. There's none. So why are there time, or why is there time... Why are there opportunities for losers to be on the card? Why? I don't understand that mentality. You have absolutely no right to call WrestleMania the Super Bowl of pro wrestling when you got matches like John Cena versus Elias being portrayed and featured on WrestleMania. And what does that say? I want to hope that this is a fucking big troll job, to be honest with you. Because I don't know how the fuck you're working for WWE and you think of John Cena, fucking 16-time world champion. 16-time world champion. And you think of John Cena and WrestleMania. Hmm, what are we going to do for John Cena at WrestleMania? Oh, I got it. We're going to do Elias. There's no way. There's no possible fucking way you can look me in the face and tell me that's the best idea you got. This guy is a bona fide first ballot fucking Hall of Famer for your company. This guy is a fucking legend in your company. This guy has how many years remaining in the ring? Barely any. He's now on a per fucking event basis, maybe once a year if that. How many times do you think you're going to be able to get him as he gets bigger in Hollywood? This is the best you got for Elias? John Cena is one of the best all-time performers for WWE, whether you like him or not. Look at this guy's WrestleManias the last five years. You mean to tell me John Cena's going to hang his hat on fucking Elias in one of the final WrestleMania appearances that this guy might have? Baron Corbin could suck my dick for the comments that he made. What a blithering fucking idiot. Danny Tejada, the guy's got a fucking brain with zero IQ. Zero IQ. Clout chasing, fucking recognition chasing, fucking dweeb on social media who doesn't know a goddamn thing about pro wrestling. John Cena versus Elias is being shit on because Dave Meltzer said it was a garbage match. The majority of the fucking community came to that conclusion before Meltzer even talked about it. Done. Done. Show this to Corbin. Show this to fucking Tejada. I don't give a fuck. Stop promoting and defending mediocrity. Stop it. Stop it. There's one thing I fucking hate. It's mediocrity. Be better. Be better. This company is in its doldrums right now. Don't give a fuck how much money they're making. It's none of my concern. They're putting on god-awful television. And if that's the best you have for John Cena on SmackDown, then Bruce and the entire staff needs to be removed. I pray that when we see him on the 28th, when we see him next week, I pray that it's happening, A, after Bray Wyatt and Goldberg. It's got to be a reason why it's not happening this week. It's happening next week after Super Showdown. I pray that, A, it's happening after Goldberg and Bray Wyatt, and B, it's going to factor John Cena into a Bray Wyatt match or a Goldberg match. Something. Something. And C, hopefully that means this is all a troll job by WWE to keep John Cena's name out of everybody's mouth as far as a big WrestleMania match because they want to keep it secretive. So they threw the Elias Red Herring out there. I pray. My fingers are crossed. Monday Night Raw. Raw has its biggest rating of 2020. 
There you go. The show sucked, and the, the rating was uh, the biggest rating of 2020. There you go. According to Showbuzz Daily, the show drew an average of 2.437 million, which is a 4.3 jump from last week's 2.337 million. In the main event of this week's show, Kevin Owens and the Viking Raiders took on Murphy and the Authors of Pain. Did this particular content creator sit down and watch this match? Fuck no. First hour of the show drew 2.671 million viewers. Wow, higher than SmackDown. Higher than SmackDown. Looks like the Paul Heyman initiatives pay it off. Compared to last week's 2.396. Something must not have been on this week as it was last week. I don't know. It's a big number for Raw. It is WrestleMania season as well. And the show has gotten a little bit more manageable, but the show still ultimately sucked at the end of the week. In the second hour, Raw pulled an average of 2.559 million. Compared to last week's 2.411 million. And the third and final hour saw an average of 2.082 million viewers, which is down 2.204 million. Wow, man, that look at that dive from hour one. My God. First hour drew 2.671 million, and the final hour drew 2.082. That's got to be the biggest deficiency in the history of Monday Night Raw. That is terrible. Goes to show you that maybe you should start being a little bit more creative on the show, Heyman. How many fucking matches or variations of matches can we see with the Ministry of Idiots against Kevin Owens and the Viking Raiders? And now Samoa Joe's not going to be there because he's out, because he's injured. Ross sucked this week. It's been manageable, but I'm surprised that they even accumulated that rating for this week's show. The show was awful. Vince McMahon changed plans for Matt Hardy and Randy Orton a couple of hours before the show. Of course he did. Of course he did. That's the way Vince McMahon operates. There is a reason why WWE was advertising Matt Hardy versus Randy Orton in a street fight for Monday Night Raw. Fightful and Sean Ross Sapp reports that the original plan for the match was to take place as advertised and it was supposed to run for multiple segments. However, Vince McMahon made the call to scrap the match and just have Orton attack Hardy again. Of course he did. The reason why the match was promoted and then taken away from us is because Vince knew everybody wanted to see Matt and Randy Orton in a no-holds-barred stipulation. No DQ stipulation. It was the highest rated, the first attack on Matt Hardy was the highest rated segment on that particular episode of Monday Night Raw. They wanted to recreate that and get people buzzing about another segment and a match with a stipulation this week when everybody seen in WWE that the fans were buzzing about it and they were interested in it. Is Matt Hardy staying? What does this mean? Everybody thought he was written off TV last week and now he's being brought back. So might he might not be written off TV. He might be brought back. He might be on his way to being broken again. All these things about Matt Hardy. WWE seen Matt Hardy was being talked about. So what did WWE do? Because they don't give a shit about their fans. They clickbaited you, as always, and they gave you not a match, but another beatdown segment, which was five times as bad as the original beatdown on the week before. And they only did this because Matt Hardy has undoubtedly told them at this juncture that he is not signing a contract and that he will be free March 1st and he will show up on AEW Dynamite and hopefully be the one that is the exalted one. The result would have likely seen Orton defeat Hardy, says Fightful. There was no word on why McMahon made the change because he wanted to bury Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy is on his way out. He realized this. And he said, you know what? He ain't coming back. Let's bury him. Here's your exalted one, Cody. There you go. As if Vince McMahon knows who the fucking Dark Order or the Exalted One is. All he knew is that Matt Hardy didn't want to go back. He's probably going to end up in AEW. Here you go, Cody. Here's Matt Hardy. He's legitimately broken. But I don't think Vince McMahon really realizes how over Matt Hardy is. Matt Hardy is a very over figure on social media. Matt Hardy's videos are very over on YouTube. And he's still got that star just feel about him. Everybody is awaiting the broken universe to come back. How much more greater is it going to be as it was in Impact on AEW? If Cody is bringing him in, he's going to be allowed to do whatever he needs to do to get that gimmick over. He knows that Matt is going to bring viewers. 
He knows Matt is going to bring awareness. He knows Matt is going to bring that must-see factor that AEW has handily over NXT. It's WWE's loss. You could break Matt Hardy as much as you want, with as many stair shots as you want, with as many chair shots as you want, with many RKOs as you want. You're not going to break him. Matt Hardy is unbreakable. You ain't going to do anything bad to him where people are going to look at him in a negative way. Vince did this out of sheer spite. So, the company felt also, this I got to give them credit on. They felt that Hardy vs. Orton match, if the match was to take place, it would make the attack from the previous week seem meaningless since it was similar to how Edge was attacked and he has not appeared on TV in weeks. Well, Matt Hardy has not had a neck injury that he just came back from after nine years. So I could easily refute that instantly. Yes, it would have made the attack on Edge look a little bit weak, but Edge's situation is a little bit different. The guy had fucking fusion neck surgery and he was told that he'd never wrestle again. He's back after nine years. Matt Hardy had not gone through being out for nine years and had no neck injury. I'm sorry. A concerto to Edge is much more greater than a concerto to Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy could have still wrestled with a fucking neck brace on if he really wanted to. He was ready to anyway from what we've seen on Raw. So I refute that mentality right away. So at that point is when the decision was made to bring Hardy back to TV this week. WWE seen plans to do this and the plans were based on the quarterly hour rating for Hardy and Orton on the first attack. McMahon is adamant that this week's attack from Orton is Hardy's last TV appearance with the company unless he decides to sign a new contract. At this point, it doesn't look like he will sign a new deal and he will be a free agent on March 1st. Hardy sent a tweet to sell the latest attack by Randy Orton as many fans picked up on how against every warning spells out A-E-W. Hardy is heavily rumored to be the exalted one in the Dark Order stable. Goodbye. Vince McMahon and WWE clearly did not know what they had in Matt Hardy, and he is better off. They usually say the grass is not greener, or the grass is not as green as it should be on the other side, or as you think it will be on the other side. In this case, for Matt Hardy's case, who has been reported that he does not need the money, he is set for life, according to reports, the grass may very well be greener on the other side for Matt Hardy, and I certainly hope so. AEW will be getting a top-tier act in Broken Matt Hardy when he is revealed as the exalted one. Vince McMahon's loss, not Matt Hardy's. Speaking of Randy Orton, Randy Orton tells Matt Riddle to fuck off on Twitter. This is not surprising at all. But how did it come about? Let's talk about it. After he attacked Edge on Raw, after the Royal Rumble, Randy Orton instantly reaffirmed himself as one of the WWE's most hated heels. Taking to social media this week, Randy Orton has certainly not warmed himself to WWE fans by telling beloved babyface Matt Riddle to quote-unquote fuck off over the NXT weekend for TakeOver Portland. Pete Dunne and Matt Riddle, the broserweights, bro, defeated Undisputed Errors, Bobby Fish, and Kyle O'Reilly. How much fish could Bobby Fish fry if Bobby Fish could fry fish? That's actually on a t-shirt, by the way, now. Yes, legitimately, it is a t-shirt. And they beat the Undisputed Era to capture the NXT Tag Team titles. Great match. Right outcomes. Great match. Merrill took to Twitter last night to celebrate, or not last night, uh, I guess, after TakeOver, or Monday, to celebrate winning... His first piece of gold since joining WWE. Responding to the tweet, former World Heavyweight Champion and WWE Champion Randy Orton told Matt Riddle to fuck off after just wishing the NXT star the best of luck. He says, and I quote, hated you. Now I get it. Good luck. Also, fuck off. End quote. Randy Orton said that he initially hated the former UFC star, but now got him. Let's hope that this was merely just Randy Orton playing into Randy Orton on social media, and this is not what he really thinks of Matt Riddle. Hopefully Vince McMahon feels that way as well. Or well, not the fuck off part, but hopefully Vince McMahon gets Matt Riddle. So, looking at the comments 
towards this tweet. Some take it as a compliment towards Riddle. Others believe it was a legitimate shot. Riddle himself took to Twitter to respond to Orton's comments. He was having fun with the situation, as he should. Please, please, keep your distance. You've been allowed to do the Lesnar thing. Don't get involved with anybody else that you don't need to be involved with at this stage. Matt Riddle said this. I woke up at the crack of noon today and saw this, and all I could think was, Randy is the coolest. Also, don't smash my head with a chair, bro. End quote. And I'm envisioning Matt Riddle in Matt Riddle's voice saying that. I can't do a good Matt Riddle voice, but I can envision him saying that to Randy Orton. There you go. A little fun on social media. Hopefully Randy Orton doesn't feel the same way, but Randy Orton probably at this point is the best thing on Monday Night Raw with his just venomous and just evil dick-like gimmick. This confused, fucking demented Randy Orton. This is the best version of Randy Orton. Love it. It's the best part of Monday Night Raw. Speaking of Matt Riddle, there's also a report on Matt Riddle. If he did not have backstage heat, Matt Riddle could be on Monday Night Raw. I'm glad he's not on Monday Night Raw. Triple H might not care what Matt Riddle tweets about Brock Lesnar. That doesn't mean that Brock Lesnar is okay with Matt Riddle tagging him on social media. Brock Lesnar reportedly got to Vince McMahon's ear on this situation. Now McMahon sees Matt Riddle as an outside guy. Vince McMahon reportedly was under the impression that Matt Riddle does not have respect for the hierarchy in WWE. Don't wrestling was over radio. Melcher discussed Riddle's title win and that WWE needs to keep him happy. It was also noted that Riddle could leave WWE if he's not happy. He has experienced the pro wrestling scene outside of WWE, so he knows that there are indeed other options for him. Meltzer went on to say that if Riddle didn't have main roster heat, he would probably be already put with Heyman on Monday Night Raw. Meltzer says this, and I quote, If WWE uses him well, then he'll stay. But he's not a guy like some of these guys are, to where if WWE doesn't use him, he'll just go and sit there and go, Oh, well... I'm in WWE. He wasn't happy in UFC. He wasn't happy in Bellator. He's only going to be happy when he feels like he's being used to his top potential. He's got to be pushed in a certain way. And also, he should be pushed in that way anyway. It should be interesting to see. But I would think, again, if it wasn't in a situation it was now with Lesnar, that he would be with Heyman on Raw, on the Raw roster, and he'd be in that Aleister Black position And he'd be doing better, much better, end quote. I think Matt, it's unfair to say Matt Riddle would be doing much better because creatively, you know, Paul Heyman might be taking care of him, but at the end of the day, he is always going to be overlooked by Vince McMahon. If Vince McMahon doesn't like Matt Riddle, Matt Riddle could have been buried. Vince McMahon doesn't get Matt Riddle like Triple H gets Matt Riddle. Triple H knows this about Matt Riddle. Vince McMahon will not know that about Matt Riddle. Cedric Alexander was going to be pushed by Paul Heyman because Paul Heyman seen him as one of the future pieces of the company. Vince McMahon gave Heyman an edict to bury Cedric Alexander. For what reason? We don't know. We don't know. Vince McMahon just didn't like Cedric Alexander at the end of the day. The same thing would have happened with Matt Riddle. And then we'd be talking about how Matt Riddle is going back to the Indies and potentially ending up in AEW. You can't do that to talent like Matt Riddle. Triple H has got it right. Keep him happy. Who wants him on Raw now anyway? The further Vince McMahon is not a part of Monday Night Raw, the further we go on here and Vince McMahon completely distances himself further and further, that's when you can start thinking about Matt Riddle on Monday Night Raw. Now? Absolutely not. The only reason why people are thinking about Matt Riddle on Raw now is because Lesnar is on Raw now. It could wait. It could wait. When Vince McMahon is more of a non-factor, that's when you can start thinking about moving Matt Riddle to Monday Night Raw. Other than that, he is perfect right where he is. And if Matt Riddle has a say, if he's going to be used creatively in a different way, and if you don't think he knows that by now, you got to be a complete idiot. If Matt Riddle is creatively happy with what he's doing on NXT, 
then keep him on NXT and pay him what he deserves. I would rather pay him and keep him on NXT than lose him to an AEW. That's if I'm WWE, of course. There are people in that company that get it, and there are people in that company that don't get it. Vince McMahon is one that doesn't get it. I don't think Matt Riddle would be very well on Monday Night Raw right now. I'm glad he is not. Samoa Joe is injured again, this time filming a commercial. Samoa Joe has had a terrible string of bad luck in 2020. He missed four months with a broken thumb last year. He had a a concussion for a couple of weeks this year already. Now it's being reported by Ryan Satan, pro wrestling sheet, that he has been injured again, this time while filming a commercial. The report says Joe hit his head during a bad table break. So he's filming a commercial where he's going through a table? For what? And why would you have someone who's injury prone going through a fucking table? The report says Joe hit his head during a bad table break and could miss a considerable amount of time. Now he's in this rival with Rollins and his disciples. He and Kevin Owens have formed an alliance to combat the heel stable, meaning Owens will be missed and... Well, Owens is going to be missing an ally. He's not going to be missed. I miss good writing, but Owens is going to be missing his strongest ally moving forward. Joe also suffered a storyline injury on Raw on January 27th when he and Owens challenged Seth Rollins and Buddy Murphy for the Raw Tag Team Championship. Joe took a hard fall on the outside. It was being reported that Joe had a legitimate concussion. It was very minor, but they kept him out for precautionary reasons. Uh, This report is saying it was a storyline injury. I heard it was a legit concussion. So take that as you will. So this resulted in the referees in this instance forcing Joe to the back to be checked out on, leaving Owens to face the champions alone. Joe has been forced to miss WrestleMania in the past, and hopefully this is not the case this year. If Joe, from what I'm hearing, he's going to be out a while. If he misses WrestleMania, that sucks big time. If Joe is legitimately out for a while with this latest injury, he's done. He's done. This is the final straw that broke the camel's back. That's it. Joe will never have a major push. Joe will never have a major title. Joe will always be that guy that they will always look at and never give a true push to, even though they want to, based on his injuries. Now, he went through a table. We don't know if it's a concussion. We don't know if it's a back injury, a shoulder injury. Maybe he tore something. I don't know. We don't know the status of the injury. If it's a concussion, WWE could possibly be looking at Samoa Joe not even competing anymore. That sucks. For someone as talented and as great and as legit as Samoa Joe, this could be the end of Samoa Joe and WWE. I hope not. I hope not. I don't know what he was filming. I don't know who he was filming for and why the fuck he was going through a table when he's an active pro wrestler during WrestleMania season. You're putting him through a fucking table? A table for a fucking commercial. Watch it be something stupid. During WrestleMania season, you're risking this guy injury for the biggest fucking time in the industry for his company and the biggest payday for him. Now we could potentially be missing WrestleMania. Shame on them for allowing this to happen. This is WWE's fault. Samoa Joe filming a fucking commercial. Imagine filming a fucking commercial, you're out six months, and has nothing to do with what is going on storyline-wise in the ring. And now you miss WrestleMania. What a fucking ridden. And you could possibly miss SummerSlam. February, March, April, May, June, July, August. Could be out till SummerSlam from the reports that I heard. Six months could be out. I don't know if that's bullshit or not. We'll figure it out. And I'll let you guys know. Hopefully I find something out more on this story. And we could talk about it on Saturday. But that's terrible. If this is it. If this if this is six months and he's out. For a really long time. An extended period of time. He's done. Samoa Joe's career in WWE is done. He will never touch gold again. Paul Heyman. Paul Heyman is allowing talent on Monday Night Raw to be less scripted. This is great. This is really, really great. Now, you could see that with what Shayna Baszler had said on Monday Night Raw, saying that she's going to 
tear the shit out of Becky Lynch. Now, one of the biggest changes in the last decade in WWE is the company depended on writers to not only come up with ideas for storylines on WWE programming, but also writing scripts for its talents to use in their promos. WWE Hall of Famer Jerry Lawler recently appeared on the Steve Austin Show where he spoke about a wide range of topics. During the interview, he talked about Paul Heyman being the executive director of Monday Night Raw that sees him as the lead writer of the show, but Vince McMahon has the final say on the script. Lawler claimed that with Paul Heyman being in charge, it has allowed talent to get the opportunity to be themselves instead of the way it used to be where they were predetermined by the writers or creative. Jerry Lawler says this, they're giving guys a chance to be themselves like Austin was back when Austin became stolen cold Steve Austin. Nobody was telling you, oh, this is how it has to be. Austin was himself and he was given the opportunity and Austin took it. Lawler then told a story about a young writer giving WWE Hall of Famer Ric Flair a scripted promo one time. I thought, Lawler says, oh my God, what on earth has happened to the business of professional wrestling? Lawler laughed. That's the part I don't get. I really do think a little, a little bit of that is changing now with Heyman in charge of Raw. Yeah, he's letting guys, like Austin said, giving them bullet points and letting them go on their own. Great. Great. You know who I see that from? Kevin Owens. Do you know who I see that from? Samoa Joe. Do you know who I see that from? Aleister Black. Do you know who I see that from? The Street Profits. Do you know who I see that from? A lot of guys. Shayna Baszler as well. You're not going to script Shayna Baszler. You don't script Paul Heyman. You think Paul Heyman reads a fucking script? You think Paul Heyman has a fucking writer handing him a script on what he has to say going out there when he's standing next to Brock Lesnar? Give me a break. Give me a break. That's the way it should be. Now, not everybody deserves that opportunity. Unless you have been trusted by the company to go and do something like that. Randy Orton probably don't have a script handed. Who the fuck is going to hand Randy Orton a goddamn script on Monday Night Raw? Seriously. You know? What about AJ Styles? AJ Styles is, uh, is a tricky one. The OC is a tricky one. I can see them being handed scripts. They do sound very unnatural. But them joking around being themselves makes me think otherwise. The best thing about this is that I see it. Normally, you could see something like that. I hope you guys do as well. I see it, and that's a great thing. Hopefully that continues to happen. But not everybody deserves that, l- that luxury. Not everybody deserves that opportunity to do that. Gain trust with the company. Gain trust with the company, work your ass off, and then Paul Heyman could look at you and one day say, you know what, this is what I want you to go out there and say, this is what I got for you. You go out there and own it. I never liked it to begin with. I never really liked it to begin with. If I am working for a company as far as a creative writer, I'm guiding. This is what I don't get. This is what I've realized while working with House of Glory. I don't like writing scripts for anybody because I don't like, I don't like telling somebody on the active roster how they should be portraying their character. I don't know their character. Well, I do to an extent, but I don't know their character to a point where that person playing the character knows their character. I'm going to use Charles Mason as an example. Charles Mason is one of the biggest up and coming guys in House of Glory. The guy's going to be a megastar when all is said and done. He has charisma. He's got a great look. He's got great promo ability. He's got a great gimmick. He's great in the ring. The guy is a five tool guy. The guy's a five tool guy. I would never sit at the HOG commentary desk and tell Charlie what to do. I would never tell him what I think his character should do. That is for him to come up with. I would rather, I would rather him take complete control of his character and then we come up as a team with a storyline, whether he likes it or not. He might like it and say, we don't need to change anything. It sounds great. I like it, but this is what I would do differently here. Other than that, great. I would never tell him to act a different way. I would never tell him to go out there and do anything different on top of what he's doing now. I would never script anybody like that because I don't live that character. 
I'm JD. I'm not Charles Mason. I don't know what it's like to play a billionaire playboy. I don't. He's got that down. He's got the character. He's got what his character needs in his mind all day long. This is what he works on 24-7. This is what he's aspiring to be. I'm only here for the ride, and I'm here to get him over to a point where I could tell the story he's trying to portray in the ring. I'm here to be a small piece of his support system and guide him through support that I have for him and everybody else in the House of Glory roster, whether it's Ken Broadway or Monte or Smiley or Leroy Green or Nolo Katano or any one of the young students or the young talents that we have on our roster. I would never tell anybody to fucking do something for their character. They know their character. That's what needs to happen. That's what needs to happen. This is a situation where if you have something like this, where, every, listen, there could be multitudes of writers. There could be multitudes of writers, but I would never have any of my writers write for any of the talents. Come up with a storyline. You're in charge of this guy's storyline. You're in charge of that guy's storyline. You're in charge of that women's storyline. And you go and come up and work with the talent on what they want to do. The talent, more times than not, has better ideas than the fucking writers themselves. Because this is what they do. I'm not going to have some fucking goon, some four-eyed geek come in here who doesn't know anything about pro wrestling with his fucking pocket protector. Oh, you, you want a blue pen? You want a, 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 a green pen? I got a stick of juicy fruit. You know? I'm not going to look at this fucking geek and ask him to write a storyline for me without talking to the talent or knowing the talent. Teamwork. Teamwork. I don't know how it is on Monday Night Raw, backstage at Raw, but... Hopefully Paul Heyman is lending his voice and his knowledge to everybody. Hopefully the writing staff is a well-oiled machine. Obviously not. The show sucks. It's gotten better, but the show still ultimately sucks. What I'm trying to get as get at is don't script talent. Don't. Don't let them go out there and be themselves. Let them own that moment. Leave it up to the fans, whether they like them or they don't. Don't go out there and script for something or someone that you don't know. Because more times than not, it will end up failing and they will never have an opportunity if someone else is writing the words for them. Let them feel it. Let them think it. Let them express it. Simple. It's simple. I hate hearing shit like that. Hopefully that's the edict that Paul Heyman continues to push in WWE on Monday Night Raw. We've seen it with Shayna Baszler. We've seen it with Shayna Baszler. Baszler cursed. She said shit. Ooh. On Monday Night Raw. Shannon Baszler responds to a idiot over her promo on Raw. Blasted some idiot on Twitter. Now, the tweet. The tweet in mention. If I could throw it up. Let me see. Do I have it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I got it. Let's talk about it. This guy, Sean Austin... Sean Austin says, I don't mind if you pull something like this, but my kids were watching. And if you aren't going to keep it PG, you should say so. Shana then says this, and I quote, or you could be a father and tell them I am a terrible person and they shouldn't like me for that or that they will get grounded and their tablets taken away if they ever do that. Because I don't give a crap about your kids, so I won't modify my behavior for them. End quote. Oh, Shayna. Do I love Shayna Baszler? She is awesome. She is awesome. So that's what she said about this geek on social media because Baszler used the word shit and it was uncensored. Here's a, uh, here's a little doozy for you. How about you don't let the fucking kids watch after a certain hour? We don't know how old said kid was. We don't know what his parenting tactics are like. But if Shayna Baszler came on Monday Night Raw and my child was watching Monday Night Raw, you know what I would tell my child? Hey, honey, or hey, son, that is your next WWE Raw Women's Champion. That's what I would tell them. I would tell them, honey, hey, son, that's the type of female you need to cheer for. There you go. I add nothing else to this conversation. I don't know what this guy's parenting tactics are like. I don't know how old his son or daughter is. Give me a break. You're blaming the performer for 
saying shit. Yet this is the same fucking kid that will go and watch, or the same parent that will go and watch Stone Cold Steve Austin fucking chug beer and do this and fucking this, right? Give me a break. Give me a fucking break. The, 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 the shows are too PG. The shows are too PG as it is. God forbid we allow a shit word to seep into the three-hour program. Oh, my God. It's the end of the world. PC pussies out there. Give me a fucking break. Shayna Bezzer did great. I hope to see more of an attitude and verbiage like that on Monday Night Raw. It gives it a real organic feel. Honestly. The show should be more like that, to be perfectly honest with you. Not overdone. Not overdone. But that's the type of shit I like. It's real. It's real. That's how people talk in real life. That's how fighters in competition talk in real life. I don't know what else you want me to say on it. Andrade and his days as U.S. champion could be over. Now, Andrade is scheduled with to, he's scheduled to return to the WWE after he finishes 30-day suspension for failing the company's wellness policy. He will be in the uh, gauntlet match, the two-week gauntlet match at Super Showdown. Now, he is still the United States champion, and the reason why the decision was made to not have him drop the title to Humberto Carrillo is that Paul Heyman felt that it was too early in the story to have Carrillo win the title. There you go, Paul. You got a fucking golf clap. Nice little birdie putt on hole nine. Thank you. Heyman is a big supporter of both Humberto and Andrade. Now, according to Sports Illustrated, Sports Illustrated says that it looks like Andrade's days as champion are numbered. Andrade's days are numbered as champion, but Bruce Pritchard still remains. How is this a thing? How is this a thing? I don't get it. According to Sports Illustrated, their sources say that Andrade may not make it to WrestleMania as champion. So, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. Andrade is going to have the U.S. title taken from him on the road to WrestleMania. Andrade is a champion deserving of a championship. He is a WrestleMania caliber athlete that is a champion at the moment. And you want to take the title from him and put it on someone who is not a WrestleMania caliber athlete, who is not a champion or in the conversation for championships. You want to put the title going into WrestleMania on fucking Humberto Carrillo. Is that what I'm hearing? Is that what I'm hearing? Whoever's in charge over at Monday Night Raw, I urge you to listen to me and listen to me very closely. The United States Championship right now is in a position in which it's dead. It is absolutely worthless. Andrade has done nothing with the championship. Those who held it before Andrade have done absolutely nothing with it. The title is a fucking prop. Legitimately. It means Nothing. It means absolutely nothing. If you put the title on Humberto Carrillo, then you are ultimately killing the championship and putting it on somebody who is not over. You need me to spell it out for you. O-V-E, Humberto. He's not over. Why are we talking about Humberto Carrillo as the United States champion? I don't get it. Humberto hasn't been ready. He is not ready. He will never be ready. Him and his fucking silly arm drags. Give me a break. I don't think Humberto even deserves to be on WrestleMania, period. Never mind a fucking championship. Just get the title on somebody else and not Humberto Let's do the Rey Mysterio and Andrade match at WrestleMania. Mask versus hair, please. Please. Can we just do that? Jesus Christ. I don't understand. 
Yeah, first you want John Cena and Elias. Now you want Humberto going to WrestleMania as the United States champion. Nice Briso match you got there, Humberto. I can't wait to not watch it. Days are numbered. Fucking Bruce Pritchard's days should be fucking numbered. The Undertaker. I got news. I got news seeping out of my fucking ears on this show, man. I'm not even done yet. The Undertaker is slated to star WrestleMania and his feud with AJ Styles when? Let's talk about it. According to a source in WWE, The Undertaker is expected to start his WrestleMania feud in Washington, D.C. on March 9th during Raw, the day after the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view. The day after the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view seems like a perfect opportunity to start The Undertaker's WrestleMania program with AJ Styles. The card is always subject to change. And Vince McMahon could modify or alter any script right up until the show like he did this week with Matt Hardy and Randy Orton. Now, the match is certainly one that fans are going to get excited for. It's a first time ever. It's a fantasy matchup. People are talking about it already. I gave my opinion on it. I think it could be done a lot better. I think we could do a lot better here. The idea of Styles taking on The Undertaker or something wrestling fans and critics have fantasy booked for several years with regards to why the duo of veterans here are being booked together at WrestleMania, Dave Meltzer is reporting on the Wrestling Observer Radio, is that because AJ Styles can afford to take a loss. He says, and I quote, at least in some ways, I can understand that match. At least, number one, AJ Styles is a heel. Number two, AJ Styles can lose to The Undertaker and it ain't going to hurt him at all. Number three, if you're going to have The Undertaker in a match, you might as well have it against one of your best guys so it doesn't suck. Do you know what I mean? You know, and one thing is most guys really that wrestle The Undertaker and lose, they don't really get hurt by losing to The Undertaker. The way AJ's been positioned, it's not going to hurt him. So it's just a way to get The Undertaker on the card. I am still looking for some news reports. I would not be shocked. I, I mentioned this. I mentioned this last week. Who knows what The Undertaker's reasoning is? The Undertaker might have actually firsthand picked AJ Styles to work with. He went to Vince McMahon and said, I want to work with AJ Styles over everybody at WrestleMania. Who knows? I mentioned this word for word. I would not be shocked if this is the case. Maybe The Undertaker looks at AJ Styles as being this generation's Shawn Michaels. And he's thinking, how can I get a great WrestleMania match and feel like I could be brought to that level like I was at WrestleMania 25 and WrestleMania 26 with Sean? How can I come close to achieving that? Maybe he's finding that in AJ Styles. Maybe that's the reason why he wants AJ Styles. Got to bring all the variables to the table, man. I talked about this word for word on the podcast last Saturday. And if you don't believe me, go back and watch it. Maybe The Undertaker looks at AJ Styles as being the closest thing to Shawn Michaels and the closest thing that will bring him to a match of that caliber this late in his career. Who knows? He deserves it. He wants it. He wants it. It's better than fucking Goldberg. Right? It's better than shitting it up with Goldberg. Who knows? We'll find out. I'm going to look for it. If I do, we'll talk about it on the podcast on Saturday. Guys... Before I go on to talk about WWE Backstage and NXT and AEW, I got to shout out my sponsor for the show. Tonight's sponsor is coming from The Ridge. Ridge Ridge.com slash scripts. I got a Ridge wallet. I love it. I take it with me everywhere I go. It's stylish. It's durable. It doesn't let me down like Monday Night Raw. And I feel very protected with its RFID blocking qualities. The Ridge helps you guys carry what you need to every single day from streamlining how you carry cash and cards in the flagship Ridge wallet to their portable charging commuter backpacks. They want to make the most out of what you bring with you every single day. I've been using the Ridge wallet for a year and a half now. Again, I take it with me everywhere I go. It doesn't bend. It doesn't fold. It doesn't break. It doesn't scratch. It's still in pristine condition. I know all my information is safe, and I love the assurance of the RFID blocking qualities. The Ridge is so confident that you guys will enjoy their product, that they made it as simple as possible. Free shipping so you guys can get it fast. Free returns in case you don't like it, which I don't know why you wouldn't. 
And if you do like it, there's a lifetime guarantee. On top of that, they have over 30,000 five-star reviews, so they have a lot to be confident about. The Ridge is super durable, made from military-grade materials like titanium and carbon fiber. It's proven to be bulletproof, waterproof, and chainsaw proof. Guys, all you have to do is the following. If you are interested in the Ridge, which I hope you are, it's a great way to support the show. Ridge.com slash script. You're going to use code script at checkout. Once again, that's Ridge.com slash script. 10% off at checkout when you use code script. And I want to thank my friends over at the Ridge for supporting off the script. Yeah, man, normally I only push stuff on the show that I will put my name to and stamp my name to. The Ridge is definitely one of them. If you guys don't have a Ridge wallet, they sell other stuff on there as well, like knives, and they have, like, portable charging power blocks. It's awesome. Backpacks, it's so great. It really is. If you guys don't own a Ridge, I would highly, highly, highly recommend it. So I want to thank them again for supporting the show. They really go above and beyond for me, and I am so grateful to have them as a part of the Off The Script family. WWE backstage rating this week with Keith Lee basking his glory. One of the biggest things in WWE right now is big man Keith Lee and his just unbelievable fucking ability in the ring. Man, I love Keith Lee. Unbelievable. The Big Bang Catastrophe is wrecking havoc on NXT. Who is his next opponent for the North American Championship? My money is on the Velveteen Dream. I think that would be awesome. An awesome show down at TakeOver Tampa. Dream versus Lee. Take my money, man. Keith Lee was on WWE Backstage and Tuesday night's episode saw a decrease in viewership. The show drew 127,000 viewers on FS1. That is down from last week's 169,000 viewers. And the show drew a 0.5 rating this week in the 18 to 49 demographic, which is down as the previous week's rating was a 0.6. The show did feature an appearance by NXT North America champion Keith Lee and WWE Hall of Famer Mark Henry, who I haven't watched this. I'm sure he put over Keith Lee. Before Dijakovic and Lee had their match at TakeOver in Portland, Mark Henry was an advocate in a very well-done video package hyping how both guys are two of the best big men in WWE right now. So uh, I'm pretty sure he put over Keith Lee. I have not watched it. I have not watched WWE backstage in a, uh, in a while. There's no reason for me to. There's nothing interesting on that show, and CM Punk really isn't adding anything to the show either, even though he's probably the only reason why anybody watches. But Lee was there to talk about a wide range of things, including his time in NXT, as well as to reflect on his moments with Roman Reigns in the Survivor Series, which impressed WWE officials, and he actually went over. I did read the transcript of this particular part of the show. He said that Roman Reigns talked to him in the back after the entire Moment happened and they got back to the locker room and Roman Reigns told Keith Lee, I want to work with you in the future. That's fucking awesome. I mean, no no matter what you think of Roman Reigns, the fact that Roman Reigns told that to Keith Lee, Roman's going to tell that to management and management's going to take Roman's word to heart because he's Roman Reigns, he's the locker room leader, and that's going to bode well for Keith Lee. Keith Lee's a made man already. Keith Lee is a made man already. Just let it happen naturally. Don't rush him up. Don't rush him to a position where, you know, it's not going to feel organic. The reason why Keith Lee is as over as he is right now is because everything is happening the way it should be happening. You're not forcing anything. So the fact that Roman Reigns said that about Keith Lee, man, not even Roman Reigns. I mean, Keith Lee versus literally anybody on that roster. Take my money. It's fucking awesome. Keith Lee is so great. So that was WWE Backstage. Keith Lee was on. I don't watch the show. I don't think you guys watch the show either. It's a work night. I would rather just sit here and play some Destiny 2 while, you know, just enjoying my Tuesday evening and not watching anything wrestling related. All this wrestling related stuff, man, I got to take a break at some point. And Tuesday is my off day, personally. AEW beat NXT in the ratings. This is not a surprise at all. But I will mention one thing. And no matter how great AEW was, one thing is blatantly obvious here. Now, the Democratic fucking presidential debate, it might be a juggernaut, and a lot of people might be watching that over anything else on TV, but those are viable excuses. 
They're not some blatant excuses that people are just throwing out there. Those are real reasons why the shows were down, or AEW was down, or NXT was down, and why AEW didn't eclipse 900,000 views, which they should have easily eclipsed, or why neither show has broken a million viewers yet, right? Well, AEW did week one, but since then, no. And NXT broke a million viewers, but that was when AEW wasn't on TV yet. So, AEW beats NXT in the ratings. No question there why. Steel Cage match with Wardlow and Cody. You got the tag team title match. You had Moxley versus Jeff Cobb. You had that Battle Royal. Just a great show from top to bottom. A great two hours of television. Dynamite averaged 893,000 viewers, up 9% from last week. In the 18 to 49 demo, the show averaged a 0.31 rating, which was up 3% from the prior week. Dynamite finished fifth in the cable TV ratings in that category. NXT was up 5%, averaging 794,000 viewers. In the 18 to 49 demo, it averaged a 0.25 rating, up 4% from last week. NXT finished 16th in the cable rankings, one of their better finishes in that category. Aside from the show, or aside from when the show ran unopposed on Christmas night, it was the highest viewership total for NXT since December 18th. The demos were different than usual this week as the show's tied in people over 50, a category NXT usually wins out in. NXT had a slight win in people 18 to, 18 to 34 and a 0.19 rating in, in, the, in that category to Dynamite's 0.18. AEW won big in the male demographic, 18 to 49, with a 0.44 rating to NXT 0.32. But with females in that range, the shows both had a 0.18 rating. The debate likely hurt NXT more than AEW, given that the debate did a monster rating in people over 50, and the category of 50 is usually NXT's easy win against AEW. The only other sports competition on the night was a college basketball game on ESPN that only aired against the second half of the wrestling shows and averaged 978,000 viewers. Miz and Misses, which follows NXT on the USA Network, had a season-high 500,000 viewers and averaged a 0.17 rating in the 18-49 to 49 demographic, finishing 40th on cable in that demographic. It's great. Fine. AEW beats NXT in the ratings, as it should, because the show was better. The one thing is, and I've seen a lot of people talking about it, and I can't help but agree, and no matter if the Democratic you know, presidential debate is a thing and people are watching that and maybe going back on DVR and watching a Dynamite or going back on a DVR and watching an NXT. They're not watching it live because of other things that are piquing their interest and are more important in that time slot on that night. And they could always go back and watch, right? Something is going to be more important than the wrestling show. Fine. Granted, that's your opinion. That's your viewing habit. The thing is, with the live viewers, they're not generating new viewers. It's always the same number. NXT's not gaining new viewers. They're not generating interest to gain new viewers. There's no new eyeballs on the show. It's always in the 50-plus demographic, they win out. And that's their key demographic. And Triple H attributed that to both of the shows being on the USA Network. Whatever. I attribute it to being NXT is a throwback to what that demographic loved about pro wrestling, and they find that in NXT more so than they do SmackDown or Raw, where it's basically enter- basically more entertainment than pro wrestling. Where NXT is more pro wrestling and very little on the entertainment. It's real. It's sports. They're not generating new viewership. They're stagnant at the 890 to 920,000 for AEW, and NXT is anywhere between 750 and 800. They're not generating new eyeballs. These are two companies, two, two big stations and networks. Where's the marketing? Why aren't people watching this show? Why aren't people watching Dynamite is the bigger question. The show is fucking phenomenal. What do they have to do to get people to watch the show? Is it really just pro wrestling is not in? Has Vince McMahon just, you know, won out over everybody? People want to see fucking cheesy cringe-like entertainment, mindless entertainment on Monday. Meanwhile, I'm watching Wednesday, and my goodness, man, I get more in two hours of fucking dynamite than I ever do watching three hours of Monday Night Raw. I could take the entire month's worth of Monday Night Raw and get more 
out of two hours from last night's Dynamite than I did all month of Monday Night Raw. Why aren't people watching this show? I could say the same thing about NXT. Why aren't people watching NXT? They've delivered some of the best TV shows in January. Ever. In December. Ever. I don't get it. I really don't understand how a combined 1.6 million watch these shows and Monday Night Raw can generate a 2.5 in the first hour. 2.6 in the first hour. Or 2.4 overall rating for Monday Night. How? Or SmackDown can generate a 2.4. How? How? It's a Friday night and the show is complete garbage. Meanwhile, Dynamite is doing everything right on Wednesday night and people aren't watching. I, I, it's a bizarre mystery. It really is an unsolved mystery. I just don't get it. I don't think we'll ever understand it. I really don't. Now, who's to say that it didn't eclipse a million with the DVRs? AEW always eclipsed a million. Dave Meltzer reports this every week. It's 1.2, 1.3 million with the DVR factored in. NXT is just about 900 to a million DVR factored in. I don't know why you're not watching this show live, but you opt to watch SmackDown live on Friday night. I don't know, man. Stop promoting mediocrity. Stop accepting mediocrity. That's the best advice I could give you. I just don't get it. Social media was buzzing after Dynamite. That former ECW champion, Raven, is the exalted one. Now, the funny thing is when I seen this, I did my review on Wednesday and people were like, I got to zing you on one of these attention to detail JDs. Or I got I to gotta zing you on this... Uh, you know, when JD says attention to detail, he wasn't very attentive because Raven was clearly sitting at the Atlanta show in clear sight when SCE was battling the Dark Order. Hey, I'm not looking for fucking Raven in the crowd, clown, number one. Number two, nobody knew it was Raven until after the show had aired. And then you see the Wrestle Geeks reporting on it and trying to clickbait the fuck out of you. And then you see all these other dirt sheets picking up on it. Nobody knew life, Okay. We all wanted to just continue watching the Battle Royal to crown number one contenders. And even when it was made into a big deal, I brushed my shoulders off and I'm like, "Eh, Raven, Raven lives in Atlanta. Raven is from the area. Maybe he wanted to buy a ticket to see what this AEW product was all about. Then All Elite Wrestling takes what everybody's talking about. They take the clip of Raven because everybody's buzzing about it on social media. He's the, he's the exalted one. And they take, the official Twitter account takes the clip of Raven sitting there and they put in quotations, the exalted one is always watching. Now, Raven might have been there as a fan. We don't know. Raven might have been there because he has something to do with the Dark Order. I don't think Raven is the exalted one. This is worse than fucking Christopher Daniels being heralded as the exalted one. That is disappointment waiting to happen. People are clickbaiting, making videos. Raven's the exalted one. People on Twitter, Raven's the exalted one. Bro, if Raven is the exalted one, I will live stream my reactions watching every greatest match by the great Kali. I promise you. We'll make a date. If Raven is the exalted one, Raven is not the exalted one. I'll even throw Jinder Mahal in there just to fucking put the cherry on top of the cake. Okay? Raven is not the exalted one. I cannot see Raven being the exalted one. If it's not Matt Hardy, I said this on Wednesday, I'm going to say it again. You might as well kill the gimmick. That is utter fucking disappointment. Who is Raven? How is Raven still affiliated with any promotion? Why would he want to be affiliated at this time in his life with a wrestling promotion? He's old. He's unimportant. He's retired. He's got a podcast, doesn't he? Give me a break. Raven being the exalted one is a terrible creative decision. And the fact that AEW tweeted out, the exalted one is always watching. They're wanting to throw you off because everybody is expecting and anticipating Matt Hardy. 
TNT is very much behind AEW allowing cursing and allowing blood. Steel cage match, Cody bleeded. MJF throwing the word shit around, people cursing very lightly, very subtly. It's nothing over the top. Nyla Rose saying she's going to be breaking bitches. They don't bleep that shit out. I love it. It's real. It gives it a real organic feel. Dave Meltzer reported on the Wrestling Observer that, and I quote, we had a lot of blood on television, which is very interesting. I mean, obviously they had to clear it ahead of time. You know, TNT is very much behind these guys for obvious reasons. They know they're underdogs in a lot of ways and they're giving them leeway because they know they're in a fight. And it adds to the cool factor. It does. When a younger teen sees that, oh, it's cool. When a younger teen sees that, oh, it's cool. They'll take it back to the fucking locker room. They'll take it back to the lockers in in, in school, in high school, right before homeroom. And the homeroom bell rings. Oh, did you see AEW? Cody was bleeding all over the place. Nyla Rose said, breaking bitches. MJF said, I don't give a shit what Cody does or says or whatever the fuck MJF goes on there and says. It's cool. It's cool. It, it's, it's relatable because this is how human beings talk. They don't take a fucking script and act like a robot. I am going to WrestleMania and I am going to defeat Rhea Ripley. I don't want to hear somebody regurgitating a script from a writer that has no idea who this fucking person is that they're writing for. It's cool. It's cool. TNT should be behind AEW. Not only because they're in a fight, but because it's real. NXT is real. NXT is cool to me. NXT's always been cool. I don't know why they're not cool to the wrestling community, but it is what it is. AEW just has that appeal. It's got that cool factor. I don't know what it is. It's very indescribable, man. They're both the same show. They really are. They appeal to the same demographic. They're both the same show. How they're not two peas in a pod at this point, I don't know. But one is cooler than the other, and I can't figure it out. MGM Grand will hold Dynamite after AEW Double or Nothing. Oh my God, this is big news, man. Not only will they got, or not only will they have Double or Nothing, but they're getting MGM Grand as well for Dynamite. AEW revealed in posts on Twitter that Dynamite will take place in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand on May 27th, which will serve as the post episode for the Double or Nothing pay-per-view. And like I said, Double or Nothing will be taking place in the same venue. That is awesome. There is an arena that refuses to work with AEW over the relationship with WWE. Fightful is reporting that AEW wanted to book an event at the former U.S. Bank Arena, Heritage Bank Arena, but the arena wouldn't do business with the promotion. Per the report, the reason is due to the fact that they have a relationship with WWE as WWE runs the arena when they hold events in that area. Most famously, this arena caught fire during a WWE show back in 2012. It sits next to the Cincinnati Reds and Cincinnati Bengals stadiums. Turns out that John Moxley has pushed the promotion, AEW, to run a show in the Cincinnati area in the fall, and he prefers the Ohio side of things for the event. It was added that Moxley and other locals to the area were hopeful that the brand would be able to run the Heritage Bank Arena. Whether AEW can convince the arena to book an event remains to be seen. You know, I'm surprised AEW has not run into this situation already. But they're lucky that this is the only time they've run into this, outside of Madison Square Garden, of course, which I think over time, you know, Madison Square Garden will welcome AEW. But it's it's crazy that an arena will refuse. Actually, I don't mind it at all. It just shows you the loyalty to, and you don't find that a, a, lot, of, a lot of the time nowadays in any sport, no matter if it's wrestling or anything. You don't find that loyalty. They're loyal to WWE. You know, WWE probably helped them with whatever happened with the fire back in 2012. And it it might be a situation where they're remaining loyal to WWE just based on that episode back in 2012. Who knows? Who knows? But the, the, the shitty thing is Moxley is from that area. And there is no other area in that area. There's no other venue in that area to run a show out of Cincinnati. So the people in Cincinnati, the people I feel bad for are the people who are AEW fans in that area that might not even ever get to see an AEW show because of this ongoing relationship with the Heritage Bank Arena. 
and WWE. Those are the people I feel bad for. But I don't think you could do anything. It's just a loyalty thing, and the people who run the arena are being loyal to WWE. There's absolutely nothing you could do about that. Again, like I said, I'm surprised AEW hasn't run into an issue like this already with their programming and where they want to hold their shows. So we'll see what happens there, and if AEW ever runs Cincinnati, I'm sure you guys will know because they'll make a big deal out of it. They have not been there yet, and if they do, they will make a big deal out of it. Cincinnati for the first time, I'm sure you guys will be hearing about it on social media and on Dynamite. Quickly, guys, two more final things before we get out of here. One small thing on Finn Balor. I don't know if Finn Balor is going to be challenging Adam Cole for the NXT Championship. Certainly looks that way because the teases about Adam Cole being the longest reigning champion and him outdoing Finn Balor could absolutely play into a storyline. So we'll see what happens with that. But Finn Balor is going to appear at the next set of NXT UK tapings. Now, WWE announced a UK TakeOver Dublin event on Saturday on Sunday night. And that will coincide with the TV being taped that will lead up to that show. March 6th and March 7th is the next set of tapings. Whether this means Balor will be appearing at the TakeOver event is unclear. But he is going to be featured on this particular two-day set of tapings. This will not be the first time Balor has appeared at NXT UK. He made a surprise appearance at TakeOver Blackpool in January 2018. That night, he was the surprise opponent for the Irish ace, Jordan Devlin. And that resulted in Balor's victory. Balor also defeated Ilya Dragunov at Worlds Collide in January of this year. Dragunov may look to exact a measure of revenge on Balor, but of course... That remains to be seen. What if Balor is coming on in to feud with Walter? I don't know. Maybe that's what he is saying is his next move in this big game of chess. Maybe he wants the NXT UK championship. Walter versus Balor? Bro, take my money. Seriously, take my money. We'll see what happens. Balor is one of the most interesting guys in all of WWE at this juncture. And finally, guys, Adam Cole could be Finn Balor's opponent at TakeOver Tampa. Adam Cole, I expect the Undisputed Era to be brought up sooner rather than later. He had an interview. He had an interview with, I believe, who is this with? Steel Chair Magazine is who he was interviewed with. He spoke about a wide variety of topics, and during the interview, he was asked about working potentially in the future with Triple H, who oversees the NXT brand, and whether he would be interested in potentially retiring Triple H, according to Cole, he wouldn't pass up that opportunity ever. And if it was to happen where his career was on the line, he would absolutely accept that honor. Anybody on our roster would agree. We all idolized Triple H or Shawn Michaels as kids. And now we've grown up. We're working together with them. We're really getting to see their minds and not only how smart they are, but how much they absolutely love this job. I wouldn't pass that up for the world. That absolutely is something that I would love to do. I know many NXT talents feel the same way, and I definitely know a bunch of fans would love it. That's that. So that's what he said. I don't know why that was a topic or why that was a question, but if there's anybody I could see in a retirement match against Triple H, Adam Cole will definitely be that guy. But I don't think that's ever going to happen. We said the same thing about Finn Balor. We said the same thing about Nakamura. I don't think that's going to happen. I'm done seeing Triple H in the ring. I think you guys are the same way. And I think the only match that Triple H has left, honestly, Triple H was to have one more match. It would probably be against The Rock. If it's not The Rock, the only other person I could see in the ring with Triple H as being his final match ever would be CM Punk. Take your poison. Pick your poison. Adam Cole and Triple H, I could see it, but I don't think it's ever going to happen. Triple H and The Rock, I could see it. Triple H and CM Punk. That'd make one hell of a fucking TV storyline, I'll tell you that. Guys, I'm getting out of here. I've been here long enough. Holy shit, my voice is going. I got my cold beverage here. I need to recuperate for Saturday's show. But I hope you guys enjoy that. Too much Baron Corbin on the mind, man. Too much letting Baron Corbin in on my fucking venomous rant. If you guys enjoy this episode, please hit that thumbs up. Please hit that subscribe button down below. The thumbs up really helps, man. So please hit that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Turn on that bell for all notifications. Check out all the other content that you missed on the channel. And I will see you guys tonight for SmackDown on Fox. Get your t-shirts. Check out Ridge. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Instagram. 
You guys know the deal, man. Everything you need is linked down below. I'll see you guys tonight for SmackDown. Hopefully, we won't be here long. And I'll see you right back here for episode 314, part number two of OTS on Saturday afternoon. See you guys then.